Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am beyond honored to be joined by Barry James, who is the last living student of George Lawrence Stone, who is still teaching this method. Barry, welcome to the show. Thank you, Bart. It's a pleasure. Oh, this is so cool. Um, we've been working on getting you on the show here for a little bit, and I'm glad we finally got it going. Um, man, that is, uh, and you're 81 years old, correct? Um, indeed, yeah. Wow. And I just love how you're still very actively teaching. And we, we spoke earlier about how um, during the coronavirus, the COVID-19 stuff, you're using Skype and just yeah. still chugging along, which is just amazing. We're, we're lucky to have you teaching still. Well, thank you. It's, uh, it's, it's the only way to stay young. Exactly. Now, um, what I want to do today is really just hear the stories about what it was like to learn from George Lawrence Stone. Um, and I want to preface all of this with, there's an episode I did with Dom Famulero about um, the history and basically the biography of George Lawrence Stone. Um, and we can briefly go over that a little bit, but if you want to learn more, a deep dive into his entire life and all that stuff, you can check out that episode that was a little bit before this one. But um, so, Barry, why don't you just tell us what was it like to learn from him and, and what, how did it happen? Right. It was at college. Why don't, why don't you just take it away? Yes. Um, after high school, um, I uh, auditioned for and got into uh, Boston University uh, SFAA School of Fine Applied Arts, which was music, art and theater in the same school. And um, th th one of the first things that I uh, that happened to me as I, I went into school, what was going on at that time is there were a lot of uh, musicians of all playing all instruments, uh, but the, the drummers I was most interested in were getting out of the military bands after the Korean War. And at that point in time, they had the you know the the uh, GI Bill, which allowed these folks, uh, these musicians, and and all of the military to be able to go on to college and be paid for that to be paid for by the government. So, you know, I'm thinking I'm pretty heavy. I uh, did very well in high school in the drum corps and, and uh, competitions, rudimental competition. And I thought I was hot stuff until I got up to Boston University <laughs> and the yeah. first week and started listening to all these folks that had been in the military band for four or eight years and they just blew me away. Well, we had our choice at that time of three, uh, staff members or teachers there. And uh, one of them was uh, Vic Firth. Another one was Bob Smith, who was the tempest with the Boston Symphony Orchestra at that time. And the third uh, drum teacher associated with the school was George Lawrence Stone. And I, I uh, sat down in the uh, practice room one day with one of the military uh, drummers that came out. And I, he heard me play and he said, you need to go study with George Stone. You need to work on your technique. And I thought, well, all right. So I got in touch with Mr. Stone and I signed up for lessons with him. At the time, he didn't come up to campus. You used to have to take a uh, subway down to his uh, studio, which was on Hanover Street in Boston, um, and pretty old district. And he was on the second floor in an old building, ramshackle building, uh, all gone now. Uh, now it's where the Quincy Marketplace is. And some of your listeners might know the Quincy Marketplace. It's a tourist attraction in Boston. And uh, Stone Studio was right there on the second floor. His dad used to use the first floor, George Bird Stone, to actually manufacture drums. Cool. And some of the George Bird Stone drums now are world famous, you know, and very expensive. On the back cover of my book, and we'll talk more about that, uh, you'll see a picture of a George Bird Stone drum uh, circa, uh, I would say, 1910. Um, owned by a friend of mine here near Orlando, and um, he allowed me to take a picture of it so that I could put it in the book. And it really is an example of, of really modern drum making at the time. So George Lawrence's son was helped his dad in the store, and then when his dad passed away, they sold the, uh, the business to the Ames Drum Company, who continued it for some years. And George continued teaching on the second floor of his building. So that's where I ended up each week, taking a subway down to his store and going up and taking lessons. And of course, he started everybody out with stick control and that he had, had published in, I believe it was 1935. 
And this was 1957, by the way, mm, okay. at the time I went to study with him. Wow. He also had a very famous student by the name of Joe Morello, who at that time was with the Dave Brubeck Quartet and, um, and uh, had made, you know, numerous records and was considered probably and was voted actually by Downby Magazine and other magazines as the best drummer in the world at the time. And he was into a lot of uh, odd time signatures and so forth. Very modern guy. And uh, we'll talk more about Joe as we go along. But Joe was, uh, you know, George Lawrence Stone's protege. And um, they worked together for about 10 years, of, you know, uh, not lessons only, but, you know, working together on uh, various books, including uh, Accents and Rebounds, which was Stone's second book. And much of that book was... Uh, done with articles and exercises that were written by Joe Morello. In any event, I started as an 18-year-old going into Boston. And to tell you the truth, when you're 18 years old, you don't realize who you're studying with, you know? I think it was four years later when I got out, and people would say to me, you know, drummers would say to me, oh, you studied with Stone, man. He's the best. He's the best in the country. How was that like? And I would say, well, he was just my drum teacher, you know? (laughs) I... I think yeah. had I known his reputation when I was studying with him, I would have been very intimidated. But Stone was a very easygoing gentleman. He wore a tie and a, and a suit jacket to in, in, even while he was teaching most of the time. And um, I, I just went in and I started studying the stick control book. Hmm. And even though I thought I had good technique, good chops when I got in there, by the time I got out, it, they were just superlative compared to when I went in four years earlier. So between stick control and he had just come out with um, accents and rebounds at the time. And we did some work with that in my third and fourth year with him. He was just a wonderful gentleman. He was kind, he was generous. And, and there there was no attitude at all. He would never give you hell. If you didn't practice, he'd just say something like, Hey, Barry, I see you didn't put in much practice this week. (laughs) You know, (laughs) and and that was my clue to get working the next week and get it on, you know. Uh, As as you know, Bart, the stick control book has become uh, the classic gold standard of drum technique books. Um, Some years ago when Martin Drummer Magazine was um, uh, going to publish their 25th anniversary of the magazine, they decided to do um, an article on the best drum books ever written. And so they contacted um, all the main drummers, the big name drummers in the country, but whether they were rock drummers or jazz drummers or country drummers and from Nashville, or they were studio drummers, uh, symphonic drummers, and they sent them out a questionnaire. And the questionnaire was just, you know, what do you consider the best uh, 25 drum books of all time? And which ones do you use and do you recommend? And when the results of that of that questionnaire came back, stick control was voted by almost every one of them. And I think there were about 100 drummers that were quizzed on this. And stick control by Stone came back as the best drum book of the era. Mm, and of wow. course, it's continued that way for some 83, 84 years now. Gosh. Um, so just taking a look at that and realizing that it's the gold standard of, of drumming and that many, 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 many students and particularly drumline and rudimental drummers have studied secondhand from that book. Uh, it was just, um, I'm very proud to have said that I had that opportunity to study with Mr. Stone quite by accident because I didn't know who I might be studying with once I got into college. And I, I yeah. just spent four years with uh, a genius. A what, genius. And that's what it comes down to. Well, and, and you also had Vic Firth there. I mean, that's pretty amazing. On its own as well. I mean, he, he's, he's no slouch, right? <laughs> for sure, for sure. Uh, there were, um, uh, you know, many drummers studying with Mr. Stone at the time. And uh, as years went by and I continued to teach the method, Stone's method, I found out that it really worked. I mean, there's just something about the way that book is laid out uh, that, that just takes you progressively through the steps that will really train your hands. Yeah. Um, a fine drummer by the name of Danny Gottlieb, who was Joe Morello's protege, um, 
wrote a, an interesting article when Joe passed away, and he said that Joe, and uh, he mentioned me in the article as well, were teaching the gold standard of drumming, which would allow any person at all, any drummer, to gain control and speed and strength in their hands and endurance by studying that method and by studying the stick control method. Mm. Um, and he's absolutely right. That's exactly what that book does for you. As, yeah, as I went through it in, in its various forms and stone would teach it in many ways. And I'll, I'll go into that a little bit with you. Sure. Um, the, um, uh, what, what became apparent to me when I went out to teach myself is by teaching that method, it just helped everybody that I, uh, and I, I would promise I would get to the point where I take a student and I said, I will promise you that if you go through this book with me, you, when you come out the other end, your hands will be super strong and super fast and you will have complete control of your limbs. And because we used to actually play the stick control with our feet. And I think Dom in his interview with you mentioned that. Yeah, um, exactly. So that, that's the, that's the book. That's mm. the classic book was voted that way by modern drummer. And, um, uh, I found it over the years to be just what every beginning student needs. And, uh, it's, it's been working for me for many, many years. Well, and, um, I find it fascinating too, that, that it's just, it's lived on for so long because it's not, uh, I think it falls in the timeless category where it's not, um, like, let's say it's not, 80s double bass drum techniques or or you could even say double bass drum te techniques for speed metal which would be very it's still current right. but like very you know this is this is very timeless and you can use it forever and and I mean I've played the drums for most of my life and I've been slowly going through it and hopefully we'll be taking a few lessons uh online with you just again cuz cuz Dom in our interview really um he he really got in my mind the whole the lineage of teachers going from Stone, Gladstone, and Moeller, that it's a very special thing to be able to take a lesson from someone who took a lesson from the previous person, and it keeps going down and down and down. So um, I think that's really cool. Um, now, can I ask you real quick? So when you're doing the lessons with George Lawrence Stone, you would get there. Did you spend most? Well, first off, let's just go super simple. Were they were they half hour lessons? Were they an hour? Were you? They were an hour lessons. Yes, they were and, an and, hour. And it turned out with him, it was always more than a half an hour. You know, I was yeah. there on a Wednesday morning, if I remember. Took the subway down to his place, and he didn't have any other students maybe until two o'clock or so. And so he would always give me an hour and fifteen minutes, an hour and a half, an hour and a half lesson. Wow. And um, here's an interesting. Uh, thing about that too. When I started, re uh, you know, doing research for my book, which is called Drum Lessons with George Lawrence Stone and, and Joe Morello and I worked on it together, um, I started researching some of the things, uh, you know, his articles and Dom Ferranglero mentioned this too. He had written many, many articles for the International Musician, which is the union, the Musicians Union magazine. And I was able to go and do some research and pull all of those out of there and um, even uh, gave some of them to uh, Barbara Haynes, who was Stone's granddaughter, lives in New Mexico. And uh, she now has finished with her with her cousins and the Stone family, uh, that book that Don was mentioning called Techniques of Percussion, which lists every one of the articles. And so Joe and I went through the articles. I had gone to New York and picked them up some years ago. And Joe and I went through them, and of course, Joe was blind, so he would have some Marvin or somebody, one of his students or his wife, read the articles to him, or I would read the articles to him out over the phone. And that's how we came about coming up with the 30 lessons by Stone in our book. And um, what, what I found is, here's a, here's an, I just want to give you an example of how this man evolved over the years. One of the Please. early lessons in the 1940s, was somebody who had asked them a question about if you're left-handed, should you be playing left-handed traditional grip or should you be playing right-handed? And, and at that time he said, no, I believe you should continue to play right-handed. Uh, using the left hand as your, now your strongest hand will help you with the traditional grip, 
you know, motion and, and, uh, it would be the best way to go. Well, fast forward now, 10, 12 years. And I show up in his, in his office, in his studio for a lesson at the end of the lesson, since he didn't come to the campus, I used to have to sign a receipt so he could get paid by the university. And so after maybe the third or fourth lesson with him, and by the way, uh, my drum teacher in high school believed in the, in that same theory that you play right-handed, even though you're left-handed and I am left-handed. So I learned to play drums right-handed. And so when I showed up at stones and we were, of course, everything in those days was a traditional grip. When I showed up at stone studio, I was playing right-handed and a couple of lessons in, I was out at his front desk. His wife was working the, the, the front desk with him, you know, doing the scheduling for him. And I was signing a receipt for my lessons. And he came out of his teaching room and he looked at me and he said, you're left-handed. I was signing the receipt with my left hand, of course. And he said, he said, what the hell are you playing right-handed for? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, this is the way I, I was taught. And, I, and, and later on, many years later, I read an article where he thought everybody should be playing right-handed regardless of the which which was their stronger hand, you know, yeah. their main hand. Huh. And so he said, no, no, we're going to change you around. So there he did a transition between 1947 or so when he first wrote that, you know, in the uh, international musician that everybody should be playing right-handed to watching me sign a receipt left-handed and saying, you're playing the wrong way. So oh, boy. The next week I went in and he switched me over to a left-handed grip, still traditional grip everything started coming so much easier for me. Of course. I wasn't (laughs) scuffling, you know, with my right hand trying to make it my strong hand. So there was, and and I found over the years as I was researching for the book that he did a transition in his own thinking uh, in, in, in just went on and on. And as he, as he matured as a teacher, he also added that to many of the handouts that he would give to his students. And when he wrote, uh, accents and rebounds, a lot of the stuff that he did with the upstrokes and taps and so forth, the freehand style, uh, w- was incorporated in, in the accents and rebounds. So he's a man that just matured as a teacher over the years, and it, it surely helped me. I can sure. say that. Yeah. And, um, and I still play left handed, and I play mirror image with my kids and my students, and it seems to work. Oh, that's funny. I just, I, I like that, that he's, I mean, if my math is correct, he was like 71-ish years old when he was teaching you, and he's still evolving, because he died 10 years later um, mm-hmm. in 1967. Um, that's right. So, wow, that's so neat. Now, um, just so I can like kind of p- become like a fly on the wall there, let me just ask you some super simple questions. Like, did you guys practice and did you work through the book to a metronome? Yes, we did. Okay. Particularly at the beginning uh, of the lesson, the first year, maybe a year and a half going through the book. And we spent, uh, and, and I'll tell you this, we spent uh, two and a half years on that book and using wow. it in various ways. And I'll, I'll tell you about that. Um, Yes, we always use the metronome, and he would set the metronome the first week. Um, I'll give you sort of a, a history or, or a setup of how we taught it. Please. Uh, the book starts on page five, and it has three pages of single beat combination. Rights and lefts, lefts and rights, paradiddles, you know, in, inverted paradiddles, and so forth. And there's, I believe, about, um, I want to say 60 exercises, 24, 48, yeah, something like that in the first three pages, 72 maybe. Um, and, and what he would do is he would take page five as an example when you first walk in and he said, now I want you to pay, play this page for accuracy. And I want you to play each exercise 20 times. Uh, some people will just say, well, I'm, I'm going to play it for a minute or I'm going to play it for two minutes. But he said, play it 20 times. So you always start a, sort of counting it. After a while, you'd get a pretty good gauge of what 20 times is and you would do that. And he wanted, because much of his teaching was based on repetition of motion. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, as I've explained this in the introduction to the book, um, to my book, and, and he really believed that, you know, muscle memory was very important. And, and he, we took that into consideration. So the first week it would take page five and we would go through it for accuracy. 
And he might set the metronome at 80 or 100 beats a minute for that. Then the next week, he would say, okay, we're going to go to page six now for accuracy, but I want you to play page five again for speed. Hmm. And he said, and what is speed? Speed is whatever you, you can handle. Sure. You know, I'm not going to set it at 180. Uh, you know, the metronome will set it at 120 or 130, 140, you know, whatever you're comfortable with. So then you would play page six for accuracy and you play five, page five again for speed. Fine. The next week you'd come in, he'd, he'd put you on page seven now, the, the last page he had in the book of single beat combination, and he would um, he'd say, okay, we're going to play seven for accuracy, six for speed, and I want you to go back to page five again and play it with your feet. He, he'd train it. So we'd pay, play every page in the book, hmm. except the, the, the buzz roll pages, actually, you couldn't do that with your feet, yeah. but, you know, but we would play, play each page in the book three times. One first week for accuracy, second week for speed, third week with your feet. And we'd work through the book that way. So you would think by the time you got to the end of the book, that would be it. Well, not so. <laughs> because <laughs> now we'd go back to the first page again, that's page five again. And what we would do that time is we would start putting four measure exercises together instead of the two measures that they were originally written in. So we'd play exercise one and exercise 13 across, across the uh, mm -hmm. aisle from there. And we play those two together. And then we would repeat a four measure exercise. Then we go one and 14, one and 15, one and 16, finish down to one and 20, you know, that's, uh, that's one and 24. And then we go back and we play two and three and, so we would mix and match all those exercises on each page. You can see that this could go on indefinitely. Yeah. And this would never end, you know, <laughs> because all we would it. do is turn those two, two measure exercises into four measure exercises, and we'd get a brand new exercise with the brand new sticking. Yeah. And we did that through the entire book again, doing each exercise. There are some four, pay, four measure exercises in the book, and we would turn those into eight measure exercises by, by mixing and matching them. God, so man, you, can, I, you can see there's no end to this book. <laughs> no, there isn't. And, and that leads us very, very uh, perfectly to um, to talk about your book. And then but before we move on to your book, I have one quick question. Was this all on a pad or did George ever hop on? Did you have a drum set in the room that you guys would practice yeah. on as well? Yes, we did. Um, everything, all the exercises from stick control, accents and rebound. We also did. Ted Reed's book, Syncopation, Progressive Step Syncopation. And he even by the third year, he took me through Chapin's book. Oh, he took cool. me through advanced techniques yeah. and um, on drum set. And uh, that was wonderful, you know, and the way he could teach that, uh, that book. And he really yeah. had the teaching down. And of course, he knew Jim and he knew, um, and he knew Ted Reed. They were friends. And, uh, you know, and uh, Bill Ludwig, by the way, quick story on, on stick control. Stick Control, as George told me, it was never intended to be a book. It was handouts for his private students. And they, and they just would come in and he would hand them this page and this page and this page. Of course, by the time I was with him, Stick Control had been published, obviously. But, yeah. you know, originally, these were just handouts. And he went fishing one time with Bill Ludwig of the Ludwig Drum Company, the, one of the founders of the Ludwig Drum Company. Yeah. And, and, and Bill said to him, George, if you would put all those handouts that you've got your people and in, in put them in some sort of order, he said, I'll publish a book for you. I'll help you publish a book. And that's how Stick Control came about. That mm. Bill Ludwig financed the, the first <laughs> wow. editions of Stick Control. Oh, my gosh. Now Stick, now Stick Control, after 80-some years, 83, 84 years, is still selling, according to Alfred, my publisher, and publishes Stick Control or, or distributes Stick Control anyway. Yeah. The the family publishes it, and uh, the Stone family, and um, and it's still selling about twenty two thousand copies a year. Oh man, yeah, that's more than most. One of the uh, best sellers. Yeah. yeah, that's more than most people can sell. Wow, I love hearing that too. That he didn't set out and say, "I'm going to write a book." It was just like, a, "Hey, you got something." I feel like some of the best things uh, in any area of life are. Hey, you might have something here. You should do this when they're just doing it in a in a pure kind of like, oh, these are just my these are just my notes for students kind of thing. Um, mm. And you yep. got to bottle the lightning. So 
All right, let's talk about your book because you sent me a copy of this and signed it, which is, I got to be honest, now one of my like, you know, prized possessions just to have this. Um, Thank you. It's called Drum Lessons with George Lawrence Stone, and it's by Barry James with Joe Morello. So mm-hmm. you can explain this better, but you, you basically just did where, where stick control can be interpreted in a lot of different ways. And it's kind of a famous book for saying that pe- people say you can look at it and then, you know, you can get go through it really quick and not really get its full potential unless you have a teacher who knows how to actually, you know, show you how to use it. So your book is a firsthand example of how to use stick control, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's what we started out to do. Here's here's how this all happened. Um, Joe Morello came to town to uh, Claremont, uh, to um, Orlando, rather. Uh, and Danny Gottlieb was living here at the time, and, and uh, he married a lovely uh, lady percussionist, Beth, who was with the symphony here and also taught at the University of Central Florida. And, um, and they met, um, I believe, at uh, the... Um, at Epcot Center when they were doing the uh, Christmas show there. And um, they travel together now, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. But Danny and Beth brought Joe in to do a clinic. And um, he just knocked everybody out in the clinic. And and, uh, he knew that I had studied with Stone. Danny told him that I'd be there. And we got together after the clinic was over. And we were walking uh, down there. We were going to go get some coffee. Uh, That's what we started out getting. We got a little something more than coffee, <laughs> <laughs> something else. Oh, um, yeah. And Joe said to me, Barry, he said, Did, have you ever done a clinic or a master class or even, even uh, you know, a professional, uh, you know, uh, lesson with other teachers? And somebody always asked, how do you play page 64, uh, 46 in, in stick control? So, and I said, it happens all the time. Because stick control is a book completely exercise. There's no explanation whatsoever as to how to play those exercises. Yeah. So Joe and I, when I told him, he said, we ought to write a book on how to play the book. He was joking. And I said, you want to? He said, yeah, you want to? And so we exchanged telephone numbers that night. And I sort of pushed him into it. And we, we, uh, we had a wonderful conversation about our love for George Stone hmm. and how much he had done for both our careers. You know, yeah. Joe, Joe, of course, was an internationally recognized drum star. And I had had a very great career as a teacher and teaching the Stone Method. And, and it was all because of George Stone. And uh, so Joe and I decided to write a book. Well, Joe, you know, being blind, he couldn't do any research. So that was my job. So for the first three years after that or so, I started researching everything I could find about Stone. And when I found out that the, um, and, and, and I did remember it after a while, that Stone had written for the International Musician almost on a monthly basis. And, the, and, the, and it was called Technique of Percussion, and it was articles. So I had been president of the Musicians Union here for a couple of years, and I sort of used my juice to get into the archives <laughs> at, in New York of the, and pick out all of these articles, and they assigned a lady to work with me, and she photocopied all of those articles for all of those years from about 19... Actually, we got one from 1941. The book only shows 46. But I found a couple articles from 1941 and 42. Um, and, but from 1946 to about, I want to say, 1963 or 4, Stone wrote almost on a monthly basis. Yeah, there were a few months missing, uh, but about the technique of percussion. So we took that stuff and we juxtaposed it over the, you know, the stick control book. And Joe and I had weekly conversations about will this fit, will that fit. Because we want, and and it turned out to be, we were looking at calling it stick control too, but as it turned out, it turned out to be lessons with George Stone. And we just came across things, and he would mention things that he remembered from his lesson 50 years ago that I couldn't remember from mine. And and Joe had had the memory of an elephant, I swear. Hmm. He, uh, He could remember things that Stone had taught him in the 1940s, 1948, 49, you know? Wow, yeah. And uh, I was 10 years after that when I studied with Stone. And so between Joe's memory and in, in, in monitoring me and 
in just helping me along all those years, we were able to put together almost, you know, three quarters of the book at that point. Unfortunately, Joe passed away while we were doing this. And so I let the book go for a couple of years. I just put it on the shelf. And then I had drummer friends of mine and so forth, and my family start pushing me a little bit. So I ended up finishing the book myself. Uh, thanks to the Stone family, they um, helped me get the, uh, the contract with Alfred Publishing, which is you know international music book publisher. And um, so now I'm right being sold with Stick Control and Accents and Rebounds, and it, I'm sold on Amazon, and I'm sold by Alfred and J.W. Pepper, and and um, it's just wonderful. Uh, the book is selling very, very well. Um, my next issue was going to be that I wanted to take this book on the road, so to speak. And I wanted my, my bucket list, uh, Bart, is to go on the road and teach the Stone method and, this, you know, the introduction to Stone anyway to new, you know, some of the younger players that are out there and go into the guitar centers and Sam Asher's and the mom and pop type music stores. Well, the pandemic sort of curtailed yeah, all of that. Of course. So now I'm teaching it on Skype and I'm signing up, you know, quite a few drummers. I've had a gentleman from, you know, um, Australia call me and is studying with me now. Wow. And um, a lot of people from all over the place, including the students that I had here in the local studio where I teach and, and uh, quite a few of those have stolen. So I've got a pretty much a full-time job now just teaching online and I'm hoping that others will join me and um, they can reach me at Barry James drummer at gmail.com or at um, three, two, one, two, nine, seven, three, zero, four, two. And I'd be happy to speak with any of them and hopefully, you know, give them some information that would be helpful to them in building their technique. Yeah. This is the book of technique that's above a, any other book is this is this stick control book and what we wanted to do is make a companion book to stick control and in it explain narratively how you know stone came to his ideas and what he taught us and the things he said to us and i think we've captured that pretty well i think you have as well and and it's just um it's it, the, the very end of the book it says why all this groundwork and and i just think it's it's like it's just so important and it goes into detail here, but it's just very important that everything builds on the right foundation. Cause, um, cool. as people say, now that's something you should probably read that conclusion because that stone sort of put it all in perspective there. Hmm. Why don't we, let's save that for the, we'll end this episode with that conclusion. I think that'll be, okay. that'll be cool. And one thing that I think is really neat is, uh, is you, as you go through, I marked it, uh, the other day when I was reading through this, you get little bits of information from guys like obviously you, but the cool thing is, is you get to hear basically from people who are no longer with us, like George Lawrence Stone and Joe Morello and little bits and facts like Joe Morello's thoughts on the use of a metronome. We kind of talked about a metronome before. It says Joe Morello saying a metronome will help you to rhythmically to be rhythmically accurate. It will not teach you to swing. The metronome can be used to gauge your development. It should not be used as a challenge. That's just that goes against kind of what I sometimes think where I think, oh, man, I need to raise the BPM today. I need to um, I need to beat myself. And I know a lot of people it. I don't think there's any wrong way to do it. You know what I mean? I think you can you can use a metronome to push you. Whatever gets you playing the drums yeah. is the most important thing. But just to get that, bits of information. That's a very good point, Mark. That's a very good point. And um, in my teaching, I found this. And Joe and I discussed this at length when we were talking about that article on the metronome that Joe put in there for the most part. And, and that's this. What happens is, and, and like, I, as I said to you, we use the metronome for, I, said the, I guess, the first school year that I was there and then the half of the next year. And then he sort of weaned me off it, you know, mm -hmm. because what happens is, and I found it with my own students, if I got them on a metronome and keep them, them on a metronome, and then all of a sudden I say, okay, let's play this exercise without a metronome. Sometimes, not always, sometimes they haven't built that inner clock. Yeah. And, and they've, con you know, the, the metronome becomes their crutch and it, and it, 
it stops them from feeling the music. And I think that's the point that Joe made in his article is that it, it will, it will help you build an inner clock, but then you have to maintain that in a clock yourself. Yeah. And, uh, very, very important. And, and you hit on a, a, a very good point here. And Joe and I discussed it. And when he put it in the metronome, what he was saying is don't let the metronome be a crutch. Be able to play with the metronome, be able to play without the metronome and still keep good, solid time. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, when you look through this, it's uh, it's very attainable um, to do. I, I don't know. It's if you go page by page and, I, and, and like I said to you that I so personally and I explained this to you on the phone, but just so everyone kind of knows, I grew up playing in rock bands, drumming for my whole life, basically got into audio engineering, still played the drums, but I I really didn't get that. I stopped going to drum lessons when I was in like eighth grade. And, um, but then I started teaching other friends and kids when I was like 17. And I really didn't have the fundamental, like right now I would have no confidence in my reading. So what my plan is, is hopefully to work with you, Barry and, and work on my reading and, and, just being able to go page by page in this book, but but I do think stick control is pretty easy. It's it's rights and lefts, and and I say that I should pause. It's not easy to do because there's a ton of different stuff. It's easy to start with because it's mainly rights and lefts, and I love how there's the it's somewhere in here. There's the hourglass where it's left 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 right right right, and then it just kind of tapers down sure. into the middle and gets bigger. Very fun exercises. Um, and I like how in your book, again, which is Drum Lessons with George Lawrence Stone, there's photographs to kind of help you of the starting position on the way down, open fingers slightly. We're doing the rebound strokes. There's mm-hmm. there's a little bit of uh, it explains what you would be, you know, what you'd be doing. And it's it's really nice to have a little bit of that uh, that extra um, some supplement to the original, which is very cool. Sure. Thank you very much. And um, that that's true. And you've hit on again uh, a main major point, and that is this: the stick control book, as you say, looks simple to start off. But as you get into the book, as an example, what Joe was talking about when we first met, and uh, he said uh, about, well, how about the lot of pages where Stones teaches the numbered rolls, singles, doubles, and buzzers. Uh, you know, as as a uh, as an exercise. Well, in the back of the book, it it shows you know, in six eight time it'll show, or in four four time even, or cut time it'll show three notes, three eight notes, and then fourteen six thirty second notes. Yeah. And you say, well, how do you count that? You know, <laughs> and that's that's the the main thing that sticks to a lot of drum teachers. I've had so many calls over the years, not from drummers, but from drum teachers, and they'll say. How do you count that? 14 against three, you know? And I would explain it to him. Yeah. I'll still counted it. And, and that's where, that's where the, the, the rub lies in stick control because you get to a certain to part, part of stick control and it's just about where the flam section starts because the flam section is very important in that book. Sure. It, it takes you from one level to another level. And, and that's, uh, you know, right after the, the triplets and the rolls and so forth. Mm-hmm. However, because the whole idea of writing this book was so they could see in Stone's own words. Remember, this book is not much, you know, the, our book is not much written by us. We clarify things during the lesson, but most of it is taken right from Stone, right from his own words in the, uh, that he did in The International Musician, where he would explain things yeah. to, uh, to drummers who would write him letters. And, um, and so we just sort of, Hold everything together when he was talking about Radham accused and you know uh, whether it be flams or drags or roughs you know drag slash roughs um, we would explain that but not with us explaining it we would go through the Stone articles and let Stone explain it just like he explained it to us and if we came up with something well he also said this that he right didn't write the articles then we would add, add that in and Joe as I said had such a great memory that he could remember almost word for word what stone had said to him 50 mm. years ago, you know, yeah. it was nice. amazing to me to listen to him, but you're absolutely right. Now, the other thing is that that's interesting too, is 
Um, and, and both Danny Gottlieb and his article for the Stone family, which is great to read. If you want to read uh, on the website, go stone, uh, the stone, uh, LLC, uh, and, and read what the family has put up there and what Don Famiglaro and Danny Gottlieb have put up there. Originally when, when, you know, Stone was teaching, he used to look at the, at the balance point of the stick. You balance it on your fingers. And that's where your thumb and finger would go. That's where it would go in the, in the, you know, in the web of the, the left hand and in the right hand case to play the, the, uh, you know, the, the uh, traditional grip. And so by the time I got to study with him, and, and of course all the jazz drummers from Buddy Rich to Gene Krupp and so forth, they would hold their stick lower, you know, right at the balance point of the stick. And that's where they would get their, their their technique and their their speed in in the case of both Cooper and Rich and Louis Belton and all those guys hmm. they would get it from the balance point of the stick. Well, by the time I started with Stone, the rock and roll started happening. You know, the end of R and B, and then rock and roll would come about, and and then Stone said, "Well, you know, I don't know whether we can use the balance point or the fulcrum point of the stick. Now we may have to because we got to hit the drum harder now." you know, than just playing jazz, which is a softer music. Yeah. And now we're going to be fighting uh, electronic instruments, electric, you know, amplifiers and huge speakers. We better, we better change the, the whole point. So he would find the balance point of the stick, and that's what I show in the book, and we would bring it back towards the butt end by about an inch. And then we would have a lot more strength in the stick so Joe and I talked about that many times, and Joe agreed that, you know, instead of showing the old method in the book, we show the method that Stone, you know, finally came up with, which was just moving the stick back an inch from the balance point in, on, on both six. Yeah. And therefore, you would have more strength, in, in, you know, you'd be, you wouldn't be hitting the nail with the hammer by holding the, the, ha the handle of the hammer about halfway up, you yeah. know? You'd, yeah. You'd have more... You'd have more Clout, if you will. <laughs> sure, you, you know, have more we'll room play to play louder music. And, yeah, it's and like, so, yeah. Stone, there's another way that Stone evolved over the years. Absolutely, you read my mind. I was a lot of guys would would I feel like in his position, if you're 70 years old, would go rock and roll. No, what the what the hell's rock and roll? We're not changing for that. But he sees no. it as I want my technique to live on forever. So let's evolve and. um that's just so cool. He seems like a really great guy in general, just a nice guy and also very oh, progressive. Was wonderful. He was wonderful. I, I think back on him and I, I say, I should have practiced more when I was with him. You know? <laughs> we all should have practiced more. And instead of doing the college social thing, you know, yeah, and, and gigging all over the place, you know, at That's that time, funny. they'd hire the, the, uh, so many, so many music students between Berkeley and Boston university and the conservatory. Yeah. That there were music students all over the place, you know, all vying for gigs. That's so funny. Let me ask you this. Uh, one more question, and then I want to read this conclusion, and we'll read again where people can find you and um, and and hopefully sign up for lessons with obviously one of the the masters of the uh, stone technique. But so I have played traditional grip every once in a while. I do it with brushes, but when I'm actually playing with a drumstick, I just feel like I can't get the right power, and I'm working mm -hmm. on it. But Will I do better if I practice stick control, traditional grip versus just using match grip, or am I okay doing it either way? I think you're fine doing it either way, and I think that's what Mr. Stone's point was in not forcing you to do one technique over the other. Okay. And he and he said many times, you know, I want you to play with what's comfortable with you. You know, if you're playing, you know, side to side, it when you roll and you're trying to get a nice smooth brothers roll, you he used to call it a, you know, whipping cream or the yeah. helicopter, you know, where you sure. come in from the side and you, and you buzz that way. If you want power and you want a pulse in the dog, you play it up and straight up and down. So yeah. same thing goes for the, whether, regardless of the genre of music you're playing. If you're playing jazz, I would say the traditional grip works best. If you're playing, you know, rudimental stuff, outside in a drum line, many, many of the drum lines in high school and college still play. They, let, they have their stand drummers play traditional grip. And yet, 
you know, uh, the, the rockers, the, the guys that are playing rock, they'll play match grip and it, it's, it works just as well. The guys that are playing funk music, you know, and fusion music oftentimes use match grip. And, sure. and, and that was Stone's whole thing, at tw- particularly when, when Rock hit the, the marketplace. He said, no, you're going to need more power. And you get more power of, uh, out of, uh, you know, the match grip than you will get out of traditional grip. You hmm. get more finesse out of the, out of the uh, traditional grip. Okay. And, um, and so, I think that holds true to today. Yeah. So I think what, whatever you're able works. able to play both, but, you know, it depends on the genre of music you're playing. Yeah, no, that's that makes sense. That again, he's a pretty flexible guy. Um, so and he was way ahead of his time. Obviously, way ahead of his time. I mean, he's still probably ahead of his time, uh, oh, yeah. even even now. So, um, all right. Before I read this conclusion, because I think it is really neat, and I think that's a great way to kind of wrap up this episode. Um, so, again, for everyone out there, I highly recommend this book. It's called Drum Lessons with George Lawrence Stone by Barry James with Joe Morello. And I think people who listen to the show know that I typically don't do things where I'm like, oh, someone's got a product and they want to come on the show. Let's talk about it and spotlight it. It's this is a very special book from a very, you know, special person who actually has a lot of experience. And it's it's one of the most historical kind of piece pieces of work that uh, I think in drumming that's out there um, as far as a book goes. So. I think if people Google it, they can probably find it, right? And then it's it's sold through Alfred, or you can find that at alfred.com, A-L-F-R-E-D. And if I'm not mistaken, Barry, right, it's, it says on the back here, it's fourteen ninety nine. Is that right? Yeah. That's and a- it's on Amazon.com as well. Okay. Boy, that's an affordable, uh, that's an affordable book. So you, you're not breaking mm-hmm. the bank by buying this, and you can actually learn from, uh, from one of the, the masters himself. So... Let me read this conclusion here so we can all learn why uh, groundwork is so important. And then we'll, we'll close it out here, Barry. So it says, conclusion, why all this groundwork? The question arises, is all this groundwork necessary? Many a young drummer will say, I never had to go through this step-by-step preparation. I picked up drumming as I went along. It came naturally to me, and I'm pretty good at it. The answer is simple. Pretty good isn't enough in this era of keen competition and understanding audiences. A drum beat or solo today must be more than a spasmatic conglomeration of bumps and thumps banged down helter-skelter on a set of skins and cymbals. It must carry a message, a message inspired by the player's thoughts and clarified by their knowledge and application of rhythmic structure. And this is where the preliminary training comes in. Quote, careful, considered, and continued practice of such combinations offered here, and in my book, stick control and accents and rebounds, will, with precise interpretation, aid in the development of a pair of smart hands, quote, George Lawrence Stone. And then back to you. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, therefore, is not an act, but a habit. There is a growing realization in science that few people are born gifted. It takes time and persistence to be world-class at anything. Always remember, you can be brilliant. You just must stick with whatever it is you want to be brilliant at. Do what you love and love what you do. Wishing you a lifetime of happy drumming. Sincerely, Barry James for George Lawrence Stone and Joe Morello. Very well said there, Barry. I love that. That's a great uh, ending to the book. I just ruined the end of the book for everyone. (laughs) Thank you, Bob. I really appreciate it. And uh, kudos to you because what you're doing right now is a great gift to drummers. And I hope more and more drummers will listen to your podcast. Go into your archive. You've got some fantastic interviews there with some of the best drummers uh, I know of and and uh, I'm sure you've enjoyed you know interviewing them I enjoyed oh, yeah. uh, Mr. Zildjian's uh, interview I've enjoyed Don Famiglero's interview with you and by the way Don has been very kind and, and helpful to me in getting this book out there to the to the public to the drumming public and I'm, I'm thankful to him and so many other drummers that uh, have been pushing the book as well and um uh, it's my bucket list now just to get it to as many people as I can. And then we, since we can't get out to the stores to see everybody and the, the uh, I'm going to do as much as I can sure. for what time I've got left to try to, you know, remind everybody about this great man, George Stone, and just what he's, his teaching and how, how great it would be if everybody just got into the technique, played it, and they'll just play better. And Absolutely. you'll see what the Dick Firth in his introduction said. He said, get this book, buy it, play it, study it, you'll play better. Yeah. Simply. Easy as that. 
Oh, that's awesome, Barry. And before we go, we both need to give a huge thank you to your friend, Tony Smothers, for yep. getting us connected. He he reached out and got all this set up on your behalf and got us connected. And um, I just think that's very cool. And and uh, like I said, we've been we've been talking for months, Tony and I, and we finally got it all together. And um, so a big thank you to Tony. Yeah, Tony's a great guy and a good, a good very fine drummer as well. Oh, cool. Great. So um, everyone out there can get in touch with Barry at Barry James drummer at gmail dot com. And then, like you said, I'll give out your phone number, Barry, because you, you did before. Cool. So it's it's uh, mm-hmm. area code three, two, one, two, nine, seven, three, zero, four, two. And you can uh, study with the great Barry James. Barry, thank you for coming on the thank show, my so friend. Much. Thank you so much. And thank you for doing what you're doing. It's just wonderful. And just uh, I hope you just keep it up. And I look forward to speaking with you again and maybe going through a lesson or two with you. Perfect. Thanks, Barry. Sounds wonderful. Thank you so much, Bart. Thanks for checking out this episode with Barry James. Um, Barry mentioned one thing to me um, after the episode that I think is cool to add on to this that uh, maybe didn't get through in the actual interview. Um, this is Joe Morello's last book that he worked on before he passed away. Um, so I think that's pretty important and uh, it's just something worth noting. Um, also, I have talked on the phone with Barry multiple times after we did this interview just for fun about his stories and all kinds of stuff like that. So um I am going to be doing some lessons with Barry via Skype, and I'll report back to you guys how it's going, probably on Instagram. Um, but I just, uh, again, I recommend trying to get some lessons with him um, if you can via Skype um, at the email address, which will be in the description as well. So uh, thanks for listening and tune in next week. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.